This has already been a day full of some really exciting discussions and um, we're about to get another really interesting keynote. So, as you know, inequality has been the overarching theme of our annual conference um, and it's a subject that many of us have engaged with through um, our clinical work, research and personal experiences. So, given her widely published work on mental health, disability and social participation, I feel that very few of us will be unfamiliar with her work, but we are especially delighted to have Liz Seyth join us today. Um, Liz is going to be talking to us about equality and recovery, um, and the policies and practices to enable people with mental distress to live, lead a full life. So by way of a brief introduction, Liz is Chair of the Commission for Equality and Mental Health. She's also a non-executive director of the Care Quality Commission, and a member of the Disability Advisory Committee of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the Committee of Health Watch England and the Social Security Advisory Committee and beyond this her background in mental health and disability policy is difficult to rival. Before her work as the chair of the commission she was chief executive of disability rights um, and she's also had roles of the director of policy and communications at disability rights commission and as policy director of mind. I don't know how you fitted it all in. <laughs> um, and last but not least she was awarded an OBE in 2009 and an honorary doctorate from the University of Kent in 2014. So without further ado please join me in welcoming Liz to the stage. Thank you so much. It's really, uh, really great to be here. And um, so I'm, I'm chairing this Commission for Equality and Mental Health. And what we're endeavouring to do is identify some potential solutions. Um, clearly, some of the solutions are absolutely macro, as we've been hearing about all day. But I think, and I think Kate Pickett said this earlier this morning, there are also things that can be done locally. There are things that can be done through national policy. We need a whole combination of things. So we are trying to identify and give air and oomph to some of those things. So um, we are starting out um, from the recognition that I think we've heard so much about today that high socioeconomic inequality leaves people in so-called inferior positions internalizing Shame, shame, such a huge topic. Um, and socioeconomic inequality being sort of intersected, interthreaded with inequality on the basis of gender, of race, of disability, and other, other factors um, that erode people's resources and people's um, capacity to take power because power is kind of stripped away from people. And we also, um, as Kate Pickett's work show, shows, um, in countries like the UK, which are very unequal, we have lower protective factors, the protective factors of trust and real engagement in community. Um, so, we are starting out in our commission, which is, comes under the uh, Centre for Mental Health, with a view, therefore, of what people need when you experience mental distress. There's a whole lot to be said about how to prevent all this in the first place. What happens now when you are one of those 23% of people every year that Kate told us about who have mental health problems? So it seems to me if you are experiencing shame, you don't just need a sort of platitude that you should be treated with, everyone should be treated with respect in the NHS, for example. Of course, everybody should be treated with respect. But in a sense, more than that, you need an experience that restores to you a sense of value and a sense of power that redresses some of those inequalities that have impacted on you so negatively. You need support and a response from other people that understands, I think somebody used the, 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 the well-known phrase earlier, what's happened to you, not what's wrong with you, that understands you in your whole life. And um, you need connection, whether that is connection with other people going through the same issues as you, so that kind of bonding social capital, or whether it's bridging social capital, whether it's that, okay, now you've got a diagnosis of mental illness, your faith community fully includes you, your employer welcomes you back. Does that happen or does it not? So that kind of bridging capital as well. So we started looking at what might all that mean in communities, workplaces, schools, mental health services. 
Um, and are there examples that offer us clues about if you, if you wanted systems that were working for equality, whether that's mental health services or education or wider systems, what might that mean? And in a way, I think one of the themes of this is, um, and this is probably like the, the, um, the, the, the rods in the birdcage we were just hearing about, there are lots of isolated examples of good things happening, but they tend to stay fragile and small and under-resourced, often funded by trusts and foundations for a set period or something. They don't get into the mainstream. What we're interested in is, are there examples that could be invested in and then regulated and, and looked at as part of the mainstream way of doing business. So let's look at what some of those examples might be. And I should say this is really early thoughts. Um, we've, we've got a request out at the moment, do reply, for both examples and evidence. So please, uh, please respond. And it's deliberately broad at this point. We will later um, funnel in and look at some, uh, some areas in greater specificity. So, um, in uh, Lambeth, uh, there is Black Thrive. Um, people know about Black Thrive? Some people may do. Um, so, um, I, I mean, just me, and I don't know about you, I think I have probably been talking for 30 years about the over the um, excessive use of coercion and compulsion, compulsory detention with people from black, British, African Caribbean, African backgrounds in this country. Um, and yet, we don't seem to have resolved the issue. And what Black Thrive are trying to do is take a community-led approach to this in partnership with not just mental health services, but also education, police, social care, all the uh, main public services in the area. They explicitly are aiming to address asymmetries of power. So that means if somebody is experiencing distress, the powerlessness that they feel is part of what, you're, uh, uh, what the response is addressing. You, it, you don't just assume that somebody is powerless and kind of leave it there. Um, Black Thrive believes social factors, housing, education, employment, money, um, you know, destitution in some cases, are part of the picture that have to that impact on well-being and must be addressed. They start from what are the wishes of people who are directly affected, and they create connections. They create connections between people experiencing distress and all sorts of other opportunities and networks in the community. But they also work with the NHS and with the police and so on to try and get those systems to change. So they are trying to be systemic. I would have to say it's early days, so you know we'll need to see what the results of this are um, a few years down the line. But as an approach, it's interesting because it's not just saying, you know, is there a better um, pathway into treatment for black British people or something like that? It's taking a much more holistic uh, approach informed by thinking about power and so on. So another um, community approach that's just been sent in to us, actually, um, and this is probably exactly an example of one of those fairly small-scale initiatives that, but, you know, has it got promise? Should it be expanded? So this is user-led support provided by and for people living with mental health difficulties, and it's based on whole-life conversations. So the conversation is, the questions that people are asked is, what, what would a good life look like? What have you already got to live that life, and what do you need? Um, and then support is offered according to that. So it's your story, your interpretation of your experience, your life. It's not, what's, it's not um, how, are, how is a professional system defining your problems or your life. Um, and you decide whether, you, whether and when you need the service. Now, this is, I'm sure, creates a lot of logistical questions, or it would do if you scaled it up. But rather than, you know, approaching a mental health service and being told that you're not ill enough, uh, you know, that awful sort of catch-22, that thing that often either you're not quite ill enough to, be, to, to get help and support, or then, you know, things get so bad that then you're sectioned. It's kind of, you know, where is that space for... 
actually, I now know I need to come back. Um, and it's trying to do that. Very interesting, I think. Um, we've also heard about community initiatives that uh, explicitly work within the frames of reference of people with different life experiences, different communities. So, for example, MindWorks, which provides counselling, particularly aiming to reach out to black and minority ethnic communities. They operate in six languages. And amongst other things, they offer faith-based counselling. So if, for example, you are a British Muslim, you don't have to, even you're going for counselling, you don't have to navigate all the issues about, so how is this, let's say, white assumed atheist or Christian uh, counsellor viewing me as, an, as a Muslim woman? You can get straight into somebody who understands the sort of the parameters around your belief system and your values, and you can then move on to the issues without those, those extra layers of anxiety. Similarly, um, Metro, a program that offers counselling for young LGBTQ people. So there's something about where people can feel that their values are aligned with the people offering support. Okay, so that's some examples from communities. Um, you, you can tell me what it would take to evaluate them and scale them and invest in them and make them or at those or and or others and change the kind of system of support that people get at the moment. What about the workplace? Uh, and I imagine that there are people here who uh, are engaged in the world of work and uh, occupational psychology and so on. So policy. Most policy on mental health and work uh, is focuses on the supply side. It kind of says, right, there's far too many people with mental health problems claiming uh, employment and support allowance or other, quotes, incapacity benefits. How can we incentivize people to work, support them to work, pressurize them to work, um, sanction them for not doing what we want them to do, et cetera, et cetera. And I know the British Psychological Society has said some strong things about some of that. Very good. Um, but what about whether the world of work is actually suitable for anybody, first of all, and secondly, for people who have mental health issues? So what we've seen in the world of work in recent years has been a decline in autonomy, which can be really, it's really important to mental well-being, but also work has become more intense. Not everybody can deal with that more expectations of multitasking, so there's less scope to kind of learn, here's a complicated set of tasks and I'll learn it and then I'm going to do it. You're expected to be able to do everything else and a bit of everybody else's jobs as well. And um, as uh, Annie Irvin said, a quote I quite like, um, perhaps the key question should not be whether the individual is fit for work, as all these work capability assessments try to find out, but whether work is fit for the individual. Um, and one of the things I've recently been involved in is um, a report that was published by the London School of Economics, um, which basically sets out a policy agenda. It's called switching focus, because it's about switching focus from the individual to what the employer and government can do. It's like a, diff a new citizenship deal, if you like. Um, you might like to have it, it's free to download, there's an easy read version and so on. And um, one of the things it looks at is how the whole kind of agenda of um, flexible work and good work and the future of work and human-centered work, the International Labour Organization calls it, um, focus a lot on parents. Great, brilliant, and, and you know, flexibility so that women can get on in their careers and everything. Um, the organization TimeWise here in the UK does some great work on how do you get promotion if you're working part-time or you're a returner to work or you're working one week on, one week off or you're working annualized hours, all sorts of creative ways of working. But it's mainly about parents and people with caring responsibilities. But it's hugely relevant to people who have fluctuating health conditions like mental health difficulties. And that could be a real massive area for expansion. Um, I think. Um, and and um, most of what does go on with employers on mental health is kind of rather softer well-being at work programs and, you know, um, 
but uh, another quote I just put up a minute ago, actually, was that you, somebody said on Twitter recently, you can't yoga your way out of toxic work conditions. So some of the, some of the things that go on in the workplace for well-being are kind of a bit marginal. I mean, it's nice to have yoga, of course, um, and to be able to go to the gym, but that's not, going to that's not going to compensate for not having autonomy or for having a level of intensity that is just too difficult to deal with. Okay, um, sorry, at school. So, um, fully inclusive education. I don't know if anybody saw a programme last night on TV that was about switching schools, and it was about... Um, it was about a school that was primarily white English kids and a school that had a high proportion of young Muslim kids and they mixed them and they explored what happened when the kids were learning together, playing together, doing all sorts of things together and their families then came together. And of course what happened was that a lot of misconceptions got broken down. It has to be done in conditions of equality. Um, and, uh, but if we had fully inclusive education, where the kids who have impairments, autism, mental health conditions were not excluded. We're seeing exclusions from school go up. We're seeing more and more kids placed in special schools, not integrated mainstream schools. Actually, that would help uh, reduce some of the prejudice and discrimination. Um, there are examples of leadership and real engagement of pupils in schools, leading initiatives. And I've just given one example here from a local health watch um, where school students led a, pro a project where they researched views on mental health issues and they, they, they got responses from over 6,000 young people. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, they found that school pressures, exams and revision were a huge issue, particularly through secondary school. Um, but they did make a set, uh, and uh, interestingly, social media was less, less viewed by the young people as a, a major issue. But anyway, um, but there were a set of recommendations made by the young people, which were taken on by the commissioners of child and adolescent mental health services and by the teachers. Um, some of those things about school pressures are, need national policy change, so you know they couldn't do everything. But I think it's an interesting example of where the leadership of the people who are affected uh, actually starts to change the conversation and changes local decision making. In mental health services, so um, work to reduce compulsory treatment and detention. So there is the restraint um, reduction network which links people up and they've got standards. So how do you reduce restraint within mental health services? Really, really promising. Um, there are people who are working towards the elimination of long-term segregation. I've just put up a, pic a photograph at the bottom, which is the father of a young woman called Bethany, who you may have heard about in the news, who, has been, who is um, in long-term segregation. She has autism. And this is her father meeting with the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State, following that meeting and looking into the issues, asked the Care Quality Commission to do a review of what's happening with long-term segregation, restraint, seclusion. Um, and there's going to be an interim report coming out from that in May. So, see, and meanwhile, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has put out a, a human rights framework on the use of restraint. I think there's quite a head of steam at the moment on why are some people being detained for long periods? Why are people in repeated seclusion? Why is there so much restraint going on, like physical restraint or chemical restraint? Why are compulsory detentions going up? What's going, and a lot of organizations are involved. It feels like maybe it's a moment where something could shift. Um, okay. Um, in mental health services, so I suppose the other sort of set of ideas is about basing services on principles of I'm using the word recovery, and I know it's a bit contested and not everybody may agree with the term, but I'm using it in the term the way it was first coined by Patricia Deegan in America, um, and she talked about it being having a life that has meaning for you, where it's, it's not a professional intervention, it's not all about people getting employment, it's about you as a person deciding what matters to you, what has meaning for you. If you've, had, you've been through that life-changing experience of having a diagnosis of a mental health problem, 
And then it's about finding your own resources and resources of communities and people around you to pursue what matters to you. That's how I'm understanding it. And um, there are, around the country, increasing examples of people more or less doing that in recovery colleges and peer support. So um, I've just put up a, a, a picture here at the front of a, an It was in 2017, Emma Watson did a whole issue of this uh, journal, Social, Mental Health and Social Inclusion, on peer support in mental health. And it just showed how hugely powerful peer support in mental health can be, as long as the values that originally underpin peers and fundamentally underpin it don't get kind of watered down. So some peer support workers in the NHS get concerned that they get a bit kind of pulled into being having exactly the same values as the rest of the clinical team. Um, they've got a distinct role and need to kind of sustain those values of equality between the peer supporter and the people they're supporting. And mutuality so it's not about a kind of a professional service user relationship um okay and just to take um another example of peer support this is a I'll just put a picture of a guy called raf who's an expert by experience and he he's written and spoken really powerfully about his experience where and he's he's and why he's doing peer support now um and he talks about it being 4 a.m. on a medium secure unit. And he talks very powerfully. I'm not reading out the quote exactly. Well, I don't know if people can see it. I will read it out if you'd like me to. Um, but he was excluded from school, went to this pupil referral unit. A few years later, he end, if you read the whole article, he ended up in a young offenders institution. And lo and behold, there were some of the same people who'd been in the pupil referral unit. A bit later on, there he is in a medium secure unit in mental health services, and again, there are some of the same people. And what he's passionate about is what kind of support, particularly around that sense of shame, the, the feeling people have that their life amounts to nothing. And this particular thing he's talking about is somebody who at 4 a.m. was kind of saying, um, there is nothing for me in life other than being in dumps like this. Um, and he's talking about uh, to a lot of young black guys. Uh, and anyway, he came through this experience and um, he now spends his time listening to people about their experience and kind of validating their experience and being somebody who's trod that path. And I think it's very, very important to people. It seems to be very important that they can talk to somebody who's been through that. Um, I think it's very powerful. Okay, so those are a few of the sorts of things that people might need. Um, I'm also kind of conscious of what people don't need. Um, and I suppose it's the, the potential for what happens after you've uh, had a diagnosis of a mental health problem for actually all that shame and inequality to just be compounded. And sadly, too often that happens. So firstly, firstly um, we know that in the world of work, so many, first of all, so many people lose their job, um, sadly. Uh, and secondly, people live with the fear of being open, um, whether that's at work or at school or on a date or whatever. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier from the floor, uh, a really fantastic film I saw yesterday by Dorset His Hidden Talents, which is all about people who became open at work, working in mental health services. Uh, it's a really, really great little film, short. Uh, and there's that sense that rather than you defining your reality, we've got a lot of evidence in already about people saying, being told that you have an antisocial personality disorder is just insulting. It's like, you know, what a label to pick up. And can we find other ways of talking about distress and experience? We could, I'm sure we'd have a hugely long conversation about that. Okay, for being further depowered, compulsory detentions are going up. And this, this graph goes up to 2016, 20, 20, uh, but 2017 and 2018, the way the data is collected has changed, but they're still going up by 8% in the last year. Uh, and you're four times more likely to be compulsory detained if you are black, black British. Uh, so massive problem about being further depowered. You can be 
detained because of a risk of something you might do in the future. Somebody um, coined the phrase, it's like having a ghost clinical record, because whatever's on your notes about risk, you can't really challenge it. It's not like going to court and saying, no, actually, I didn't do it, or there really were mitigating circumstances. It's just there on your record. It affects whether you can get housing, it affects whether you can get a job. Um, would recommend um, George Schmuckler's recent book, Men in White Coats, Treatment Under Coercion, looking at the trauma of coercion, but also looking at what's wrong with our legislation. Um, also, being further depowered. Now, we, policy tells us all about, everything's about co-production and engagement and voice, and isn't it? And it's all fantastic. However, the latest National Community Mental Health Survey sadly suggests that things are getting a bit worse. So 27% of people responding didn't know who was organising their care and services. That was an increase. Only 52% thought staff really understood the impact their mental health needs had on their life. Only 55% thought their personal circumstances were really taken into account. All those things in your life about poverty and employment and everything. 47% um, didn't really know the plan for their care. Again, it had got worse. And of those who did, only half were as involved as they wanted to be. That had got worse. Only about 75 Oh, sorry, I mean 75% weren't really involved, if you add, uh, calculate those figures, in treatment and support. And it's getting worse. So that's a real problem. Um, and finally, being further isolated. So the Life Opportunities Survey found people with a health condition or an impairment were more likely than other citizens to have only seen one or two people in the last week, more likely to only have one or two people they felt close to, more likely to say they'd seen people they felt close to less than they would have liked to. And social isolation, as you probably know, um, is bad for your mental and physical health. So if isolation may have played a part in your mental health problems in the first place, it then seems to get compounded. And just to show one graph, this is a key article, I think, by Hoff Lundstad and colleagues, uh, basically what it shows is those long black lines, these are impacts of various things um, on, uh, on your health. And um, so, so the t longest lines are about social relationships, and they are bigger lines, put simply, than either smoking or drinking or obesity. So social isolation is just such a massive public health issue. And for people with mental health issues, unfortunately, social isolation is a massive issue. So, we've got a lot of challenges. The Commission for Equality and Mental Health, set up in 2018, will report in 2020. We are seeking what are the ways to address these challenges. So some of those challenges are quite discreet, aren't they? What would help overcome social isolation, for example? Um, and we're looking at the social and economic determinants of mental health, unequal access to support and unequal experiences and outcomes. As I said, we're going broad at the moment. We want to find the potential solutions that could make most difference, and we want to stop them being marginal little add-ons that if somebody's got a tiny bit of funding for, and make them into something that gets investment, and build their learning into the mainstream, so that mainstream mental health services, education, workplaces, actually help to redress inequalities rather than compounding them. Uh, we've got a fantastic group of commissioners, just putting up their photos there. Um, this is all online, you can have a look. Um, we would, um, we'd love you to uh, submit evidence. Um, we're interested in what could the measures be and the accountabilities as well, what could the regulation around this be. Um, do let us know on Twitter, visit our website um, and uh, I'm really interested in the alliance that um, Kate Pickett mentioned earlier and the social action um, work that BPS is involved in and so on. So I'm hoping that we can kind of make some connections to sort of amplify the good work that's going on, as well as address those huge macro issues about inequality in our society more generally. Thank you.